Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm going to give you a sort of crash course in, uh, in quantum computing and try and give you at least a little bit of an idea of this crazy idea for, for quantum computing called topological quantum computing. Uh, now, uh, this is going to be a bit of a crash course, so feel free to, to break in and, and, uh, and ask questions. Of course, if you ask any questions that are too good, I might tell you to come back and write an honest thesis with me here at ANU. Uh, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, also, uh, it really is a crash course on something a little complicated in 45 minutes, so I'll probably tell one or two lies. I heard some people up in the back there talking about non abelian anyone's already. So I suspect that someone in the audience who might know more than me uh, what I'm talking about, so forgive the lies. Okay. Um, so what is, first of all, a quantum computer? Well, so first of all, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, what quantum computers can do, what they might be able to do. Of course, we don't, we don't have one yet. And the first answer to what can, computers, what can quantum computers do is not very much. Unfortunately, uh, you read a lot of uh, very enthusiastic stuff in newspaper articles and sometimes scientific papers and, and sometimes even press releases. Uh, playing all sorts of things which are manifestly silly. Uh, in particular, you see people saying that quantum computers perform all possible calculations in parallel universes. And they don't, and that's silly. And uh, it can sort of give you over-ambitious ideas about what quantum computers can do and what they're for. They're not intended as replacements for, for standard computers. We're not going to throw out our laptops and replace them with quantum computers. It's even exceedingly unlikely at this point that there'll even be a little quantum processor in the corner of your laptop. At the moment, quantum computers are only very good for some very, very specialized tasks. Now, in fact, there are so few problems quantum computers are good at that I think I can basically list all of them here on half a slide. And except for the things here, they're useless. Fortunately, some of the things on this, some of the things on this list are pretty cool. So, a first thing that quantum computers can do is unstructured search. This is like something called Rover's algorithm. Now, unstructured search basically means like you've got, a, you've got a haystack and you're looking for a needle. So in particular, it's not a talking about searching where you can sort of, searching in names, where you can order them in alphabetical order and then do a very fast uh, binary search. It's, it's just you've got a whole pile of objects, all that you can do is pick up one at a time, see if it's the one you want, and put it back. And obviously, a classical computer, or us in a classical world, take an amount of time proportional to the number of objects in the pile to find the needle. Order. And the amazing thing uh, that you can do with a quantum computer is find your needle in the square root of the size of the final time. Okay, completely ridiculous, but that's one of the first things. Unfortunately, unstructured search isn't something that we actually do very often, so that one's not something we do. A kind of cool problem that quantum computers uh, can do quickly is the discrete log problem. So uh, take some, some finite group and uh, think about two elements, g and h, in your finite group, and now your problem is to find an integer k so that when you raise g to the kth power, you get h. Okay, it's, it's like finding logarithms, but it's in a finite group. And it turns out that quantum computers can do this well. Better, we, we expect, than any classical computer. And the discrete log problem has a few nice consequences. Once you can do discrete log, it turns out you can factorize instruments in, in polynomial time. This was sort of the, the big headline result in the early days of quantum computing. Uh, that particular thing is called the Shor's algorithm. And a nice consequence of, of being able to do integer factorization fast is that you can break most commonly used encryption. Uh, in particular, the, the encryption you use talking to your bank. Uh, when you're, when you're so one presumes that amongst all the people at universities working on quantum computers, the NSA is also working on quantum computers, because they'd like to rather do that sort of stuff. Uh, maybe they already have them, but, but I, I, I would be pretty not surprised. Uh, but again, this isn't actually as big a deal as, as you might think. You have to say most. And in fact, there are perfectly good encryption systems, uh, in particular elliptic curve cryptography, which as far as we know, quantum computers are completely helpless against, and we could switch over to those systems pretty quickly if we wanted to. So it's, it's some fun mathematics that you can do with the factorization. But the real world application is maybe not so important. Okay, the final thing that quantum computers are good at is absolutely fabulous. Quantum computers can simulate other quantum systems efficiently. And, uh, well, what's the point of that? Well, I mean, it would be fantastic. It would be absolutely revolutionary to be able to do this sort of stuff. At the moment, 
Uh, I think you guys probably know what superconductors are. These materials carry, carry electricity with no resistance. They only work at very cold temperatures. You've got to carry around your liquid nitrogen, maybe even cold, I don't remember, uh, to make them work. And it would be lovely if we could have superconductors and just work at room temperature. We could do all sorts of fancy things. But at the moment, there's not really a good way to go about trying to find a room temperature superconductor. You put a bunch of minerals in your, in your cooker and you cook it, and then you see if it superconducts. And there's not really that much theory that lets you predict ahead of time whether some particular material is going to be good. And having a quantum computer would let you do something new. It would let you think up some potential new design for a, super, a room temperature superconductor and try it out in a computer without actually having to do anything. And that's just one example. There are lots and lots of things in, uh, in physics and, and uh, in biology and lots of other sciences where a quantum computer would be potentially extremely useful. Okay. So that's a little bit about what we might want quantum computers for. Let me now try to tell you what actually quantum computer is and what's required. So I'm going to do this. Uh, by first of all telling you what a classical computer is, uh, in part because it's not immediately obvious what a classical computer is according to a mathematician, uh, if you've only ever interacted with real-world computers rather than mathematicians' versions of what a computer is. And I'm going to try and just go along side by side, on the left side of the slides I'm going to tell you about the classical world, on the right side of the slides I'm going to tell you about the quantum. So first of all, what is a classical circuit? Well, a classical circuit it's a function that takes uh, some string of bits, zeros and ones, maybe n of them, and outputs another string of bits, zeros and ones, maybe n. But it's not just an arbitrary function from, uh, from n strings to n strings. We have to specify this function in a particular way. We have to build it out of some standard gates. So it doesn't really matter what the standard gates actually are, but you might imagine you, you know about all the functions and the next order and opposite. So here's a little circuit. And the idea is that you send in the input on the left, and the input passes through these gates as it goes from left to right, and you get an output out of it. So, for example, if you, if you send in a word 110, let's see what will happen. The 11 one one will go into the, the end gate and spit in another one, and then what, what will we have? We'll have uh, you know, the point after the end gate, one of the one, and the bottom string one of the zero. So, that one and the zero will go into the exclusive OR gate, and that'll come out as a one. So the first bit of the output will be a 1, then let's see, a 0 on the bottom screen will go into the not bit and give us another uh, 1. So 1, 1, 0 will come out as 1. So in particular, you can't just tell me that your function is uh, read the binary string as a year and answer yes if Australia will win the Ashes that year. Okay? You've got to actually explicitly show me the circuit that you want to use in order to compute the function to count as a, as a circuit. Okay. What is a quantum circuit? Well, instead of a function from strings of bits to strings of bits, a quantum circuit is a unitary matrix. And just to make things a little bit uh, definite, let's say it's a, a 2 to the n by 2 to the n unitary matrix. So unitary just means that the, uh, the, this matrix is invertible, and its inverse is given by its conjugate transpose. Okay. Some condition on uh, 2 to the n by 2 to the n. But again, it's not just any old unitary matrix, you need to show me how you're building it out of some standard gates. And what are those standard gates? Well, it's just some finite collection of small unitary matrices which I'm going to sort of let you use as building blocks. And then you've got to specify how you build your big matrix just out of those building blocks. Now, in the classical case, it was sort of obvious what it meant to build a function out of building blocks. On that circuit on the left, when they sent in the, the string 1, 1, 0, those first two digits, 1 and 1, got sent into that first AND gate, and the zeros were passed along the bottom screen for that. So I've got to tell you what it means now to sort of assemble a, a few little matrices according to a little circuit diagram like this to get a big matrix. Okay. So this is what's written down in the, in the parentheses now. The basic idea is that if you look at each sort of vertical slice of this quantum circuit, we're going to uh, Interpret that as some 2 to the n by 2 to the n unitary matrix. And then to get the final unitary matrix this circuit represents, we're just going to take the unitary matrix into each vertical slice and multiply it to get an answer. So suppose we've got at the beginning of our point quantum circuit this unitary matrix W, but it's also got a string ball. Okay? So 
W is going to be some smaller matrix. Let's imagine it's just a two by two matrix, A, B, C. Okay? I need to tell you how, what, what putting a string below a two by two matrix does. What it's going to do is it's going to give us a four by four matrix, which basically uh, replaces each entry in the, uh, in the two by two matrix with a little copy of the identity matrix multiplied by that. Now, if you know sufficiently much in your algebra, uh, you'll, you'll recognize that you can kind of describe it here with this tensor in the matrix and the identity in another matrix space. But it doesn't matter. You can just look at these explicit things. So, uh, if I put a speed below a little uh, quantum gate, like that, if I put a speed above a little quantum gate, I do this instead. I take two copies of my identity matrix and put them into the blocks on the back. So, okay. so, those are the rules. We've got some standard set of quantum gates, it's called W, B, Z, half oh, doesn't matter exactly what they are. And a quantum circuit just means you assemble this together in some diagram and tell me the unitary matrix. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's what we do. Classical circuits work with squeeze of bits with, uh, with this functions on, on, on finite sets. And quantum circuits work with functions on finite sets. And quantum circuits work with complex vectors. So, we've talked about circuits, next let's talk about algorithms, and then let's talk about computers. Maybe I'm using these words in not exactly the formal sense. A classical algorithm. Well, let's just talk about algorithms for decision problems. So a decision problem is one where, for each input, you're just meant to tell me yes or no. You're not meant to do any other computation. Is Australia going to win the Ashes in 2050? Yes or no. Well, a classical algorithm is a family of quantum circuits, one for each n, and each of the, the, the n quantum, oh, sorry, I wrote quantum circuits, of course I should have written classical circuits. A classical algorithm is a family of classical circuits, f subscript n, and we, uh, the nth circuit takes a string of n binary bits and outputs a symbol of zero or one. Okay. But there's an important restriction here that this family of classical circuits doesn't get too complicated. Okay, if I'm looking at the nth circuit, it's not allowed to use more than p of n uh, gates in the circuit, where p is some some quantity. Okay, so as n increases, you're not allowed to just make exponentially complicated circuits as the size of the input space goes up. You're only allowed to make relatively small circuits, polynomial size circuits, depending on the size. Of the okay, so then what's a, a quantum algorithm in this sense? Well. It's just the same definition with classical replaced by quantum. It's a family of quantum circuits, that is a collection of unitary matrices, u sub n, the nth matrix is, a, is 2 to the n by 2 to the n, and again, they're at most polynomially complicated. So using our fixed set of gates, each u sub n can be built using uh, only polynomially many of the standard gates. Uh, yep. You would be saying without this polynomial restriction, it would still be reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I should have written here a, a classical polynomial time algorithm or something like that. But uh, uh, yes. Uh, okay. So finally, what do you do with an algorithm? Well, you run an algorithm. So what does a what does a classical computer do? Well, if we have some, some input, let's call it x, it's got length n, all what a classical computer does is prepares the nth circuit in the algorithm, f sub n, and applies that nth circuit to our input, and we get out a zero, all, and that's our yes or no answer. So let's uh, give an example of an actual decision problem and the, and the family of circuits that answers it. Let's ask a very simple question. Is x greater than or equal to eight? So here, uh, little x is the uh, is the number represented by the binary string capital X. Okay. So how can you decide if a binary string represents a number greater than or equal to eight? Well, it's pretty simple. All that you have to do is you can ignore the lowest three digits, because that just tells you what the number is mod eight. And then if any digit above the third one is one, then certainly our number is bigger than eight. Okay. Sixteen binary. Zero, zero, zero. All we need to do is check if there's a, there's a high bit. 
we can just use the standard inserts. Uh, take the first few inputs down at the bottom and just dig those, we don't care about those, and then use a sequence of all bits to just check whether any one of the other bits is turned on and answer that. And you can see that this is certainly a polynomial family of circuits. In fact, it's a linear family of circuits. For the, the nth circuit, we need exactly, uh, I guess here, there were seven inputs and we needed uh, three or bits. For the nth circuit, we need n minus four bits. Okay? Maybe you should count these, uh, throw out the inputs as a sort of data. Okay. A quantum computer has to do something a little bit more complicated, a little bit, or at least something a little bit less familiar. So what do we do? Uh, we take our, our input data, which is just a classical string of bits, and we, so that's our, our capital X, and we sort of promote it to a, a sort of corresponding quantum object, which is just a, a vector in some vector space. So I'm gonna write V subscript X, which is just the x basis vector in c to the 2n, the 2 to the n dimensional vector space. So you read your input as a, as a number and just write down the, that number basis vector in our, in our vector space. Okay, so then the quantum computer, once it's seen the size of the input n, it uh, prepares the corresponding unitary matrix u subscript n, it multiplies the unitary matrix in the vector, you get some new vector c to the 2 to the n. And then finally it has to do something uh, called measuring the first bit of the output, which is uh, definitely an unfamiliar thing, but let me just say precisely what it means here that you can ignore it. It's something, it's something that really sensibly corresponds to doing the measurement. Oh, let's say it quickly. So we've got this, this vector space c to the 2 n basis indexed by uh, strings of binary digits, n digits long. Okay. So there's a subspace of that space <coughs> spanned by the basis vectors uh, for strings starting with a one and then continuing up. It's a half dimensional space. So let's think about the projection in C2 here for the subspace of strings starting with one. And then we just populate this now. We put our output uh, unitary matrix of binary vector in here, and we just populate the inner product. U applied to V with uh, U applied to V and then cut down that to the computer. And then we look at its absolute value squared. A little bit of thought shows you that this number, its absolute value squared, is actually always a number between 0 and 1. Uh, and if, the, if that number is above two thirds, you, you say that the algorithm is saying yes. And if the, the number is below one third, you say the algorithm is saying no. Okay? And so uh, the claim that I made a few slides earlier, is that, uh, well, I guess none of the problems that I showed you earlier uh, were actually decision problems with yes and no answers. They're things about factoring images and so on. But you can convert them into decision problems, and the claim is that there, are, there really are quantum algorithms that, uh, that solve those problems. What I'm not going to do today is tell you anything about how you actually do, how you actually implement those things. Okay. Uh, one question you might ask is, what if this number is between one third and two thirds? Okay, what does that mean? Well, that's just saying that you haven't had any written down algorithm for this problem. Okay? Any, any, uh, any algorithm that sometimes outputs one half just isn't an algorithm that, 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 that answers a decision problem. Okay? We are growing the industry now, and we're always thinking. Uh, so, okay, so that was all pretty abstract, this description of, of what a classical computer is and what a, uh, what a quantum computer is. But somehow, after that, I think that you, uh, I think that you should come away with that description that the program, the person who invents Grover's algorithm or Shaw's algorithm or some new exciting algorithm to solve a new type of problem, is going to come along to us, the sort of the engineering people, and say, here's a big unitary matrix, or rather, here's a family of, of, of bigger and bigger unitary matrices. 
Your job is to be able to very efficiently apply these unitary matrices to, uh, to arbitrary vectors in the, in, the, in the appropriate vector space and tell me the answer. Well, not quite tell me the answer, tell me this, this measurement number that, that we just talked about. Okay. And so this is sort of the, the, the task of building a quantum computer. It's to work out a way of efficiently and accurately applying unitary matrices to vectors. Okay, that's, that's in some sense all, all of the is. But now, of course, you guys know how to take a matrix and multiply it by a vector, okay? Doesn't that make you guys all quantum computers? Seems like it's not a big problem. Uh, the, the point is that uh, we have to do it, uh, we have to do it efficiently. The, if the, the computer matrix that we've been given has a description uh, in terms of a quantum circuit that occurs A events, the time it takes you to work out the answer Work out this company here and say yes or no. Uh, should be proportional to or only in that number of events. Okay? And if you stop and go down and think very carefully about what you have to do in order to, to uh, multiply out unitary matrices and do it accurately enough to give this answer, you'll discover that you couldn't do that in one real time number of events. So at least you don't know how to do it using using some So the, that's the that's the truth. The, the quantum computer needs to efficiently apply. <laughs> now, there are quite a few proposals out there uh, for ways to build a, a quantum computer, and um, many of them are remarkably sensible, and uh, you know, there's in fact some groups in Australia who are doing great things, uh, and, uh, working very hard to, towards building quantum computers, and, and maybe they'll get there. Uh, but I want to completely ignore all the sensible approaches uh, and tell you a crazy idea. Uh, this idea of a topological quantum computer. Now, before you get upset that I'm telling you crazy things instead of sensible things, um, let me just say that this is a crazy idea in the sense that it's much less likely to work that is achieve a, quantum, a working quantum computer than the sensible approaches. But if it doesn't work, or well, whether, whether it works or not, it's going to work or not for mostly independent reasons than the reasons why the sensible approaches are going to work. Okay? So, given that there are lots of us, we should try several things at once. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the sensible approaches are going to run into a hurdle that uh, this is going to Okay. So, here's where we get to the uh, some physics. And physics is not my strong point. Uh, so, you're looking for lies in what I say today. The lies are going to be in the next couple of slides. Uh, but I'll try and, as quickly as possible, get back to the mathematics. Uh, for, for slide okay. So there's this amazing device that a few people in the world are capable of building, which exhibits this thing called the fractional quantum hall effect. So the, the hall effect, first of all, is something that we've known about for a long time. Something. Uh, it's basically just that if you take a wire and run a current down it and then apply a magnetic field across the wire, you've now got charges moving down the wire in a magnetic field and so they experience a, a force to the side and what you'll see is that if you, if you measure the voltage across the thickness of the wire, you'll see a little potential difference across the wire, basically because the charge carriers moving down the wire are being pushed to one side of the wire preferentially over the other side because of the magnetic field. Okay? That's the whole effect. Now, the quantum hall effect was discovered much later, and it's an amazing thing where you, you do this in a super cold wire in an extremely high magnetic field. And when you now look at the graph of that, of say that voltage you see across the wire as a function of some other parameter, say the magnetic field, instead of it just being a linear function, as the magnetic field gets stronger, uh, the, uh, the, the voltage gets higher, you start seeing these little steps. Instead of a straight line, these little integer steps. It goes up in one step, and then it's constant. And it goes up in one step, and then it's constant. It goes up in one step, and then it's constant. And that was the integer fraction of, uh, the, sorry, the integer quantum hole effect. And then a little while later, some people managed to zoom in, write down the very first couple of integers, like 0, 1, and 2, and see what this little graph looks like, that, that voltage growth of that magnetic field. And what they discovered is that there are funny steps, funny rational numbers. There's a step at 12 fifths. There's a step at 5 halves, as well as the steps at 5 fifths. 
and something very strange is going on in the systems. And one attempt to explain what's going on in some of these systems uh, is, a, is a topological quantum field theory. Uh, now, uh, you might have got the impression in my slides earlier that I actually think about quantum computers. I don't really think about quantum computers. I think about topological quantum field theory. Let's talk about a, a little bit more physics before we try and say something about topological quantum field. So what do these devices look like? You've got these two slabs of crystal. Uh, they're, they're both gallium arsenide, but you've done some fancy stuff in them, whatever. And in between the interface of these two slabs, there's, a, there's an electron gas that's, that's trapped in this interface. And, uh, and if you zoom in this region right, this electron gas is, is constrained to a little puddle. A little, a little region in the interface. It's a two-dimensional physical system. Nothing is going on in the slide at all. And for the sake of making things interesting, although in practice this is extraordinarily difficult, let's imagine that this puddle has some little holes. So I'm going to think about this picture. Something interesting is going on in the ground region. So we'll just see what's in place. What's quantum mechanics? Well, <laughs> quantum mechanics tells you that uh, whenever you have uh, some quantum mechanical system, then its state is described by some vector in some complex vector space, a Hilbert space, a vector space. Okay, so states of systems uh, are described by vectors in some corresponding vector space. And when you transform the system in some way, for example, just let one second pass, or, or maybe just then the evolution of that state in that vector space is just described by multiplying by some unitary matrix. And quantum mechanics is a whole package of tools to tell you which vector in which vector space and which unitary matrix. Okay? Doesn't matter. The amazing fact about the fractional quantum Hall effect, the first amazing fact, is that if you look at the, the ground state, so the ground state doesn't mean this entire vector space that we're talking about but just the piece of it that corresponds to the lowest energy states. So it's an eigenspace of some sort of number here. Doesn't matter, some subspace. And the first amazing fact is that in these systems, the ground state of the space is, is bigger than one dimension. And this is a very unusual thing. I've, I've heard people say, uh, physics abhors a degeneracy, which basically means that ground states are nearly always one dimension. And it's very, very hard to arrange systems in physics, greater than one dimension. But fractional quantum Hall effect systems are one of the few places in the world where we see this exact degeneracy is that you really do have a more than one dimension of Hilbert space. And further, this Hilbert space only depends on the number of holes we have in that puddle. It doesn't depend on the shape of the puddle, it doesn't depend on uh, it doesn't depend on the shape of the holes, and it doesn't depend how the holes are arranged. It just depends on the single integer, how many holes are there. And, and that's, that's its sort of, sort of extraordinary. So this ground state Hilbert space is going to be the space that we're, we're going to work with, that uh, two of the interdimensional vector space that, that we need in order to do the uh, quantum computing things. Right, these have the dependence on the number of dimensions. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the size of the interdimensional vector space. And in fact, it depends in a sort of strange way. Uh, in, in some of the simplest systems, it's given by taking the golden ratio and raising that to the number of poles and then well, finding the event. I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're kind of ridiculous formulas for the dimensions. Uh, okay. So, uh, okay. So this ground state Hilbert space is going to be our computational space. And the, the reason this is plausible is it's bigger than one dimension. In most systems in the universe, you don't have access to bigger than one dimensional ground states. You only have one dimensional ones, since that's very hard to do. This is the first reason why. This is not totally crazy. Okay. So what happens next? Well, let's imagine, and this is definitely uh, a flight of fancy by now. You can't actually do this with a real device in the lab. But let's imagine moving the holes in this puddle about. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can sort of apply a voltage on, on a wire that's sort of hovering above the, the puddle, and that creates the holes by moving the wires around. Okay. So. If you move the holes very slowly, 
and then after you've moved around for a while, you come back to the same position that they were all in before. Then uh, the unitary matrix that tells you what happened, in fact, preserves the ground state, and the vector in the ground state stays in the ground state, so you can just forget about the rest of the corpus spectrum, just focus on this little one. And we get some unitary matrix uh, taking the maps a vector in that ground state and another vector in that ground state. And the, the second amazing fact about the fact that this is sort of, this is not, this is a, this is a fact that you're feeling ambitious and, and, and optimistic about how everything works. Uh, this unitary matrix doesn't actually depend on the geometry of the motion that you did. You take your two holes and go like this and move them around in a kind of square pattern, you get some unitary matrix. But if you kind of just wander them around, and then you put them back where they started. As long as the topology was the same, they passed around each other the same number of times, you get identically the same unitary matrix. Okay? And this is the second amazing thing about these systems, which potentially makes them good for building quantum computers. Because you can make lots of mistakes. It doesn't really matter the details of how you move things around. As long as the topology is right, the holes move around each other the right number of times, you get the unitary that you're looking for on the matrix. So here's a little picture. Uh, which is meant to represent uh, what you would get if you uh, move the holes around and sort of trace out a picture of the puddle over time as the holes move. Okay? And so this is a this is a braid, like you can see right there, and right there. Uh, but here it's sort of the, the, there's two spatial dimensions and one in time. But the point is that for every braid, you get some unitary matrix. And this unitary matrix really just depends on sort of the isotropic move these things around a little bit, as long as they don't pass through each other, you get exactly the same matrix. Yeah. That's a fabulous question. Well, let me get to my next slide. Uh, okay. So, this setup, where for every puncture disk we have some vector space, and for every way of grading the punctures around, we get some unitary matrix. This is more or less Mostly less, a two dimensional topological quantum field theory. I mean, there's some extra data as well, but this is an important part of what it means to have a topological quantum field theory that associates quantum distance to vector spaces. And, <laughs> and now, the amazing fact about TQFTs is that it appears, this is still a conjecture at the moment, but it's a, one of the, it's a pretty well supported conjecture, and a lot of people are kind of with it, uh, is that the most two dimensional topological quantum field theories. If you give me any unitary on that vector space, we can find some grade that approximates that unitary arbitrarily well. So, so the unitary operator corresponding to that grade is arbitrarily close to the, the unitary that you just looked up and gave. And moreover, if that unitary had a short description as a quantum circuit, that is it only used a small number of gates, then you can approximate it using a grade as a small number in the small means of polynomial Okay. So putting all these amazing facts together is the topological quantum computer. So we, we were given our input data, which we're meant to be uh, running our algorithm on. So it's a string of like n. And we, we look at the n, and we work out how many holes we're going to need so that the vector space for the punctured disk with that many holes is big enough to contain a, a 2 to the n dimensional vector space. Okay. And now, our topological quantum computer goes away and does some engineering and builds some gallium arsenide crystals and sets everything up just right so that we've got a puddle with, with m holes in it. Okay. And now, you take the unitary matrix that your, your quantum computer scientist gave you implements his algorithm, and you pick some grade that approximates it well, and you do that in a way that makes sure the grade isn't too long, as long as he can promise that his unitary wasn't too long. And now you initialize the system, sweeping an awful lot on the right just there, but uh, it means that you, you put your quantum system into the state corresponding to this, this input data x, and now you just literally grade the holes around your device. Okay, how would you going to do that? Now you've got the, the new quantum state of the system, and you perform a particular measurement on it, which gives you this number. Well, really, it, it 
it says yes or no, and you have to do these a few times, and you get a probability answer. But probabilistically, you can measure that number. And if it's less than a third, you answer no, and if it's greater than two thirds, you answer yes. Okay? That's how the quantum computer works. Now, this is a, a sort of the simplest variation of this idea that could possibly work. And there are many more uh, variations on this idea, most of which are more physically plausible because they don't actually involve having to braid the holes around each other. Okay, so they cheat and then you to, to achieve the same result without actually moving any holes. Uh, but this is the basic idea, and everything else is sort of an Okay. So uh, a number of Laboratory groups still use all devices, and also a theory group at Microsoft's Hadron Cube, which is Steve mentioned today, I worked with for a while, are, are working to, to implement exactly this and, and the normal laboratory. Okay. So, instead of moving it here, most two dimensional computer activities are good enough in the sense that you can approximate. So what TQFTs are there out there? Uh, well, there are very, very few that we're sure actually appear in, in physical systems like the crash and quantum world. In fact, there's one that we're sure appears in a, in a, in a physical system, the crash and quantum world effect, and a few more that, that we just don't need to step uh, But there are more TQFTs. We know, of, we know of a lot of them. But in some sense, there are very few. And this is the, the main thing that, that I think about in terms of TQFTs these days. Uh, you could describe a, a TQFT, the way I described it, was something that the punctured disks gave you vector spaces and the grades gave you maps. It sounds like a kind of topological thing, but you could very precisely pin down just a finite amount of algebraic data that you need to, to, to specify to say what a, a two dimensional TQFT is, or to, to exhibit an example. And it turns out that the constraints on the algebraic data are very, very strong. And it's kind of hard, it's extremely hard to, to invent TQFTs. Uh, not like many objects in, in algebra where if you've got the axioms and it's easy to just spit out lots of examples or, or even spit out whole unclassifiable family of examples. Here we've really got exceedingly few examples of TQFTs. So the two things that I try and do in that direction Try to come up with new ones. Uh, sometimes we have from other sources you know, hints that one might exist, and then there's a problem actually constructing it. But then also to try and classify it. not quite all TQFTs, but all TQFTs in certain regimes, maybe with a small number of quasi particles, or quasi particles with small dimensions, in various different ways to make it a, a more factor. And this uses uh, a surprising, uh, uh, uses mathematics from lots of different areas. Which there's algebra, there's combinatorics, there's topology, there's even some monomial algebras lurking in here. Uh, I should have said number theory as well. It happens that you get to use number theory in these cases. Uh, and what, what do you see? Well, there are some, there are some pretty well understood families of TQFTs. Some of them have come from sort of classical bits of mathematics. If you give me any finite group, I can construct a two dimensional TQFT for you. So in that sense, there's tons of them. Uh, and there are other families coming from quantum. But then there are just these sporadic ones that we have uh, very little understanding of. We don't know any really good reasons why they exist. We just have kind of horrendous proofs that these TQFTs really do exist. And so the questions we sort of want to answer about those are, well, do these sporadic, bizarre ones actually fit into families that we haven't seen yet or understood yet or make them easier to understand? And then just how many of these sporadic ones are there if they really are sporadic? Maybe we've found them all already. There's only kind of seven sporadic ones. Like in the classification of, like in other classifications, like the planet and strikes. Or maybe it's just that we haven't looked very hard yet, and we're only seeing a tiny little corner of this big space of all the TQFTs. And so the thing we've seen so far is just sort of the random gap that falls down the bottom, but actually out there there's all sorts of stuff we never know before. At this point, we've never seen it. And then there's a whole other question is which one of these TQFTs do you think, well, is it actually useful or not? For quantum computing purposes. You can ask questions like, well, what do you need to know about a TQFT before you know that you can approximate arbitrary unitary as well? Uh, how efficient is that approximation? If you 
unitarian is defined in terms of k quantum gates, how long of a grain do I need to get to approximate it? And then you might try and think about uh, which TQFTs are more likely to be relevant to physics uh, in trying to direct yourself towards the ones that maybe the physicists and engineers will uh, one day be able to produce. Okay, that's all I have to tell you. Thanks. Just scales linearly with, with some uh, with, yeah, with some coefficient that depends on the details of the uh, For example, uh, the, the simplest TQFT that might let you do all of this, and which people think they're seeing in, in the real world, uh, you take two to the n. Uh, what do you mean? You take two to the n, the log of two to the n based on Yeah, so the question is about uh, the, the sporadic examples and how you find them. Uh, so, the, I think the, the idea of, sort of trying to study uh, all TQFTs at once it came sort of late in the game. Uh, when, when actually you already seen examples coming from a bunch of different places, so there's been some from finite groups and some from quantum groups. But then the subject that has produced, yes, basically all of the sporadic examples we know about now uh, uh, is the study of von Neumann algebras. Uh, so von Neumann algebras are basically, you should think they're like, they're like matrix algebras, and by matrix algebras, but n is equal. They're, they're, they're a good way of thinking about them. And now the, there's a subject in von Neumann algebras called the subfactor theory, where you basically think about one von Neumann algebra sitting inside another. With a bunch of extra conditions on the And people spent a long time trying to trying to understand what possible subfactors there were, and they started discovering some weird examples there. And then a little bit further down the track, we realized that all of those subfactors actually give you two-dimensional TQFTs. And so the sporadic examples that we have came from that kind of strange origin. Uh, although now we're at the point where we sort of understand the combinatorics and the algebra of TQFTs enough. So we can just kind of go looking for them directly, cast a net into the sea, see what monsters we pull out of the deep. Uh, and, but, but those sort of fishing expeditions are in some sense really unappealing. Uh, we find these sporadic examples which are cool because they're strange and we don't really know what to do with them. But um, the proofs that the sporadic things we discover that we exist are completely unreliable. So they, they, they just take short. There's this gadget. You can, you can see how it's connected. Some of them are, some of them are pretty strange. Right, yeah. I realize that you are not supposed to be able to talk about this kind of science. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I also realize that you said that um, there's a simplistic version of actually being able to run one of the people. Yeah. Is there a possible way that you can simply be able to run one of the people? Well, I mean, you can, you can even argue. So, I mean, you want to, so say that you've got your little puddle, and say that it's possible to kind of uh, put some, uh, some gates, you know, some, some, little, some little strips of metal on top of your crystal, in a, in a few places over the puddle. And now, merely just applying a voltage to those gates will, will change whether the fractional quantum wall state can, can occur sort of beneath that gate. So by turning these, these gates on and off, Holes in, in the, in the, in the earth, I guess. And you could then imagine that like, a whole network of these gates is sort of turning some on, turning some off, and sort of push the puddle out. But, I mean, yeah. in terms of the engineering, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty nice. But that's the sort of thing that you're imagining. Okay. 
Um, well, yes and no. So, so let's see. Um, we're, we're used to thinking, you know, some quantum mechanics. So yeah, if you need to run, run it's fine, I'll try and answer this one quickly. So we're used to thinking in the real world that all particles are either bosons or fermions. And basically what this means is that uh, if you take two particles uh, and you exchange them, just swap them over, then the quantum mechanical state of that system either doesn't change at all if the two particles are bosons, or it changes by a factor of minus one if the, if the two particles are fermions. And it's even a theorem that that's got to be true and there's no other way to do things. Uh, but that's not happening in this system, uh, pretty much because it's two-dimensional, that theorem doesn't apply. And you would have thought, well, but our world is actually three-dimensional, you can't escape just by doing that. But it turns out you really can, and, and these quasi-particles that are constrained over the two dimensions really can obey exotic statistics. Now that all said, it's not totally clear that the spin statistics theorem really applies in three dimensions of quasi-particles out. And so there, I mean, I don't, I don't actually know that anyone has like a, a schematic recipe for building a quantum computer with, with uh, topological phases in other dimensions, but it, it's certainly not obvious to me that it's impossible. I mean, we have, much, we have much better sort of laboratory examples of topological phases of matter in two dimensions than we do in any other dimension. 